My name is Jason Craig. I'm the director of uh, graduate student uh, education here at Marymount University and uh, part of the PT faculty in the Malik School of Health Professions. And tonight, in case you're wondering why you're here, you're here for the Malik Lecture, uh, which we uh, host every year. And this year we're uh, going to spend this evening discussing and talking about the opioid crisis uh, that we face in our country. Now this is not an easy topic, and for many of you, in fact even today, uh, somebody came to me and said, you know, this, this personally impacted me, and they weren't sure whether it was going to be easy to be here or difficult to be here, but we want this to be a safe place. We want this to be a safe space where, where you can hear from our pile of experts. You can hear their stories, and they don't have all the answers but they can at least tell their story and their, what they know. And then we can spend time talking to each other to encourage each other. There's a number of activities and events that are going to be held on campus over the next number of weeks where we're going to develop uh, our knowledge and our awareness of this issue. And so please, if you're here on, as a student, if you're here on site, um, just keep an eye out for the, the posters that will be there, the sessions that are available if you're on faculty, then please just uh, encourage your students to, to avail of the services um, so that we can really understand this whole epidemic and understand how we as an institution can move forward with it. So I'm excited that you're here. I'm glad that, that we all made it, that uh, the snow didn't come again today, uh, but that we can actually spend this time together. I want to introduce to you the dean of our school, Dr. Gene Matthews. He wants to share a, a few introductory words uh, with us before we open it up to our panel and the people that you've really come to see, which is not me. Dr. Matthews. Thanks so much, Jason. Uh, let me just comment on how full the auditorium is and how great that makes me feel. Uh, I am thankful to each of you for taking time out of your busy schedules to come and have a conversation with us about this crisis. Uh, to be sure, this is a thorny issue, one, as Jason said, that doesn't have easy answers. Um, we're here to share, all of us, to try and identify how we can collaborate to move forward on this. Because to be honest, it will take all of our best efforts to be able to move uh, past this issue. And whether you are part of our uh, Marymount community or you're one of our community partners who has joined us this evening, uh, everyone knows someone, someone they love, someone they know, who's been impacted by this issue. Uh, this touches all of us deeply, and we hope that tonight we'll begin to have some meaningful conversations involving people from a variety of disciplines. Uh, it's important that we focus on this. Today, as I was thinking about this event tonight, I was hard-pressed to identify another public health issue that has gotten so much uh, traction and attention so quickly, whether you're talking about the region or the Commonwealth or the nation. So I, I'm heartened by how many people are here this evening who want to participate in this uh, conversation, and I hope that it continues over time. So I thank you so much for coming, and before we introduce our panel, I would be remiss if I didn't thank a few additional people. Uh, when we began to have this conversation about what we would do for the Malik Lecture, um, I said just one thing, it's got to be interprofessional, you can do whatever you want, but it's got to be interprofessional. And so we have a fabulous team uh, from the School of Health Professions, three departments, uh, Health and Human Performance, <laughs> Nursing and Physical Therapy, who came together to do all the planning for this evening. Uh, and I want to thank each of them. Uh, Jason Craig. you just saw, uh, Sky Donovan, Colleen Sanders, Michelle Walters Edwards, Diana Benskis, really carried the significant weight associated with getting a wonderful panel, making all the arrangements uh, for this event, uh, and I want to thank them very much. Um, I also want to thank 
Fred and Marlene Malik, who were the benefactors of the school, who unfortunately were not able to be here tonight. They had another commitment. Uh, when you have a date, and then you have to change it because of uh, weather events, uh, not everyone is able to uh, make it. In addition to that, uh, President Shank sends his regards. He is out of town on university business, as is uh, the provost, Bill Eamon. So they each send their thanks to you. And uh, without further ado, we're going to talk a little bit about our panel. So on the panel tonight, uh, as our moderator, uh, we have Jason Bellamy. Jason is the vice president of strategic communications for the American Physical Therapy Association. Jason represents APTA, represented APTA at the Obama administration's opioid working group in 2016 and oversees the association's ongoing opioid awareness campaign, hashtag ChoosePT, which has won multiple national awards since its launch in June of 2016. Next we have Mr. Greg Smith. Greg is the owner and founder of Pivot Physical Therapy since 2002. Pivot has 270 offices on the East Coast, uh, and uh, Greg also has some prior experience as the head athletic trainer of the Washington Capitals from 1999 through 2017, and also the Anaheim Ducks from 1997 to 99. Uh, Greg specializes in sports-specific rehab and is a conditioning consultant with the NBA and NHA athletes. He holds a Master of uh, Science degree in Athletic Training, a PT Assistant degree from the University, uh, excuse me, California University of Pennsylvania, and a Master of Science degree in Sports Science from the International S uh, Sports Science Association. Thank you. Uh, we have Senator Barbara Favola, a state senator of Virginia since 2012. Sen Senator Favola was instrumental in leading legislation to help foster children transition to adulthood. She was involved in policy reform that de-emphasized punitive disciplinary measures in public schools and required a more comprehensive service-based model for addressing behavioral issues. Senator Favola is the chair of the Commission on Youth and the Women's Health Care Caucus in the Virginia Senate. She also serves on the Joint Commission for K-12 Reform and a host of other committees. Many of you may know Senator Favola, excuse me, Favola, as a result of her 14 years of service on the Arlington County Board, during which time she held the role of board chair for three terms. As a board member, Senator Favola served as a strong voice for human rights, led the region on smart growth policies, and created the partnership on children, youth, and families. Last but not least, we have Captain Brian Burke. Captain Burke has been a member of the Arlington County Police Department since 1987. He is currently assigned to the Northern Virginia Criminal Justice Training Academy as the Deputy Director for Basic Training. Captain Burke has held several key assignments in IT, criminal investigations, community policing, internal affairs, special operations, Narcotics and the Civil Disturbance Unit. He was instrumental in bringing crisis intervention training to the Arlington County Police Department. We have a lot of credentials here. <laughs> Captain Burke is a member of the Arlington Community Services Board and the Arlington Mental Health Criminal Justice Review Committee. He has an Associate and Applied Sciences degree from Northern Virginia Community College a Bachelor of Arts from the American University, and a Master's Degree from Boston University. And he serves as an adjunct professor of criminal justice at Marymount University. Captain Burke is a graduate of the Virginia Police Chiefs Foundation Professional Executive Leadership School, and currently serves the Alumni Association Board as the immediate past president. He's a graduate of the FBI National Academy, the Police Executive Research Forum Senior Management Institute for Police, the DEA Drug Unit Commanders Academy, and the IACP West Point Leadership Development Program. Last, we have Ms. Grace Caulfield. Grace has worked in the field of addiction for 23 years. She brings to the Colmac Outpatient Recovery Centers a wealth of knowledge and experience with both adolescent and adult populations as well as a strong background in family therapy. 
Ms. Caulfield has worked in a variety of clinical settings, including inpatient, outpatient, psychiatric hospitals, halfway house settings, and she joined the COMAC team in 2013. She holds a master's degree in counseling psychology, is a licensed professional counselor in Maryland, holds her CAD, CAC, AD, CACAD through the Board of Professional Counselors of Maryland. She received a Level 1 Trauma Certification through the Institute of Advanced Psychotherapy and Training, which she currently incorporates into her clinical approach and practice. In November of last year, Ms. Caulfield transitioned into the role of Director of Clinical Outreach with the organization. In this role, she's able to develop and manage local referral relationships with inpatient detox facilities hospitals and physicians in the community. In addition, she assists the CEO in maintaining and leveraging local professional relationships and increases prevention efforts within the college and university settings through that outreach. Now I'll turn the program over to Jason. Please give a hand to our wonderful <laughs> So it's a pleasure uh, to be here tonight to see a full house. I'll echo what the Dean said. It's gonna take people coming together like this uh, in rooms like this and the rooms uh, adjoining this, this facility where people are watching remotely, the people who are watching on Facebook Live right now, it's gonna take all of us coming together to work on this. Um, I figure the best place to start is a little bit of context with how we got here. And so, you know, this, this is a, a big issue. It's a complex issue. At its heart though, this is an outgrowth of a effort a good faith effort to help people with pain. That's how this started. Um, what happened in the mid-90s was there was a focus really on stopping the sensation of pain itself. And ultimately now we can recognize with retrospect uh, and in hindsight at the expense of sort of finding the underlying issues, treating other things, and obviously not appreciating what the risks were at the time. Um, so, so that's what, how we got here. And um, moving forward, the healthcare system, society, needs to re-examine how we're going to approach pain, what we're going to do, how we're going to change not just healthcare, but our cultural attitudes about pain. And I hope that's some of the things we talk about tonight. Um, my goal is to keep the conversation moving. I'm going to start from my left and, and move across the stage and uh, leave time for all of you to have qu ask questions later and engage in this conversation. Um, I want to make, there's certain things we can't forget whenever we're talking about the opioid crisis. The first one is that opioids are not bad all of the time. So there are certainly cases in which opioids are an appropriate part of healthcare. Cancer treatment is one of them. End of life care is one of them. Uh, times when you prescribe, or prescribe appropriate doses of opioids and pair that with some of the other treatments and really monitor those. So opioids can be an appropriate and safe part of healthcare. Um, but the other thing we can't forget is opioids do come with serious risks. It's addiction, it's uh, withdrawal symptoms, it's overdose. And those risks are very real, and uh, people are going to respond in different ways to opioids, but because one person may not have a problem doesn't mean we can't minimize the, the potential problems for another person. And then the next one is that this is affecting people. So, I mean, I'll read some stats for you. You know, an estimated 2.4 million Americans have an opioid use disorder. Uh, Opioid-involved deaths doubled in the past 10 years and quadrupled in the past 16. In 2016, American life expectancy of birth declined for the second straight year for the first time since the 1960s. And it's easy to hear those stats and think of them as numbers, and we need to remember they're people. There are people who have families, there are people who have loved ones, and this is really impacting us on a very human, personal level. Um, and on that note, we can't minimize what it means to have pain. Uh, it's easy from a distance to think about this as a, well, if you have pain, don't use the opiate option, use something else. Um, but opioids are effective at stopping the sensation of pain, at least in the immediate. And if you know somebody who has been in so much pain that they can't sleep at night, that they can't walk down the hallway to the bathroom, that is severely debilitating to your quality of life, to your feeling as a person, and we need to remember that as we have these, these dialogues. And then the last thing is that treating pain is complex. Uh, in retrospect, again, we, we see now that we are oversimplifying the problem to think you take a pill, your pain problem is gone, and we can't fool ourselves into thinking that the solution is another quick fix. It's not going to be that. It's just not. So without further ado, I'm going to start with Captain Burke. Um, let's take the, the sort of aside healthcare, I'm not going to say non-healthcare uh, part to, to start this dialogue. Um, 
how right now is law enforcement responding to the opioid crisis? Not just in terms of a uh, dealing with illicit use, for example, but in terms of being part of society and trying to help this uh, this problem. <coughs> Your mics. Not on yet. Uh, hopefully. Okay. There we go. <laughs> Got it. Um, <clears throat> I want to uh, preface my comments with um, letting you know that. There are more than 18,000 law enforcement agencies in the United States. Um, so the approach that law enforcement takes to this issue looks different in different communities, depending on the severity of the issue um, and many other factors related to the issue, uh, whether it's an urban community like Arlington or a rural community. Um, and uh, so my comments are really going to be focused on some of the things that we're, we're doing in Arlington and uh, some more generic comments uh, based on knowledge that I have of various other law enforcement agencies and how they, how they are dealing with this. So um, from my perspective, how, how we kind of get here to, to a crisis. Um, and it, again, this strictly from my perspective, and this is a, a little oversimplified, but the way I see it is um, we have, uh, um, the, it, it was recognized as a big issue, opioid addiction, mainly through pain management. Um, we, uh, as government, have taken measures um, to deal with it initially through enforcement. Uh, and through legislation. So a crackdown on prescribers um, and tightening down on doctors being able to write for um, opioid painkillers has often resulted in people who have become addicted turning to the street to get the drugs because it's not just as easy anymore to doctor shop or go to a pain management specialist and get prescription after prescription. Um, secondly, the availability of uh, the, the opioid painkillers on the streets, such as OxyContin, um, are, uh, they're, they're less available now, okay, because of enforcement efforts and other factors. So what has happened then, next, is that people will turn to a readily available and cheap alternative, and that is heroin. Um, and many people that we come across have started out um, as legitimate pain management patients or have had some chronic uh, pain issue, a back issue, whatever. Um, and through the course that I've described, we've ended up, they, they've ended up turning to the street. Um, I, I have lived through and, and been in, in a position of enforcement through the crack cocaine epidemic of the late 80s and early 90s and the methamphetamine epidemic uh, of the 2000s. What's different today is that there are real, really no demographic walls around this issue, where there were more around the other issues. So, this issue, as many of you unfortunately know, affects people just like us every day. Um, and we have to come to grips with how to deal with it. So law enforcement, uh, it's a little cliche to say that we're on the front lines, but in a way we are. We often are referred to as a social service agency of first resort because we get there first, no matter what the issue is and we have to figure out what to do with it. So normally, our, our, how we're trained uh, to deal with these types of things is, is to look for punitive measures, to look to arrest. Um, we are learning quickly that um, we can't arrest our way out of this issue. Um, so what uh, law enforcement is doing or should be doing is uh, taking a much more comprehensive and coordinated approach to our response to um, victims of overdose. Um, just using the term victim is something different for, for law enforcement. Uh, it used to be if we came across someone who had overdosed, 
they, uh, perhaps if they lived, they would be arrested. Um, that still occurs today. Um, but they would be referred to as uh, the arrestee or the subject. Uh, and now we really refer more appropriately uh, to people who overdose as victims. Um, we partner, um, and this is all work in progress, we, we partner with uh, social service agencies, with substance abuse, with mental health, um, and we try to get people into, uh, if they're fortunate enough to live through an overdose, um, we try to get them into treatment. Uh, unfortunately, sometimes arrest is the only way for some people to get into treatment because they don't have the, the ability to seek the treatment themselves. So sometimes arrest, you know, oddly becomes a good thing because it often forces treatment. So in Arlington, we, we actually have a, uh, a a retired narcotics detective who is a full-time, has been hired back as a full-time opioid coordinator. And he responds or is aware of every opioid overdose um, that occurs in the community. And he reaches out to his partners in uh, substance abuse and social services. And as a team, they try to direct people into treatment before it's too late. Um, one of the aggravating factors uh, about obtaining, uh, turning to heroin uh, and getting it on the street is we now have a problem with something called fentanyl. Fentanyl and its derivatives um, are, and I say this a little tongue in cheek, but made in a bathtub in China someplace. And, and they're, they're not naturally occurring. They're, they're laboratory created. Uh, drugs and they're uh, in the neighborhood of a hundred times more potent, stronger than uh, morphine or heroin. Um, drug dealers, they are in business to make money. So they are on to the fact that they can get a bunch of fentanyl, uh, they can cut heroin, and now we're seeing it in cocaine as well with fentanyl or carfentanil, which incidentally is used as a tranquilizer for like circus animals, like elephants. Um, and uh, they, the, the addict, uh, the person who's addicted to the, to the opioid or the heroin is totally at the mercy of an unscrupulous drug dealer, someone who only cares about making money and his, his clients, his or her clients, are completely faceless. So we put a, um, a, a big focus not on arrest of the victim, but in furthering the investigation of the dealer, trying to find out where, what the source of the substance was. And uh, we have a lot of tools at our disposal uh, at the state and federal level as well um, to try to affect uh, effective and thorough investigations on dealers to try to get them from um, piping this stuff out into the street. So, Senator, I'm going to next, and, and we, we hear that and we, we see an image of what's happening on the streets of any neighborhood, you know, to, to refer to your point. It doesn't matter the, the socioeconomic uh, demographic, it's happening everywhere. Um, when you hear that from a legislative perspective, uh, at the state level, if you prefer, what, what can we do? What can we do to support the communities that are in need? Well, that's a great question. Um, Certainly, it, this is an enormous problem, but it's not just a problem for the person who is suffering the overdose. It, it's a problem for family members, it's a problem for communities. So in 2016, Virginia applied uh, to the federal government for a grant, and um, as part of our application, we said we were going to look for very creative and innovative community solutions to this opioid crisis. We actually won the grant, it was a $10 million grant, we're funding five pilots throughout the Commonwealth. 
And the pilots that were successful had several criteria. Um, communities came in with a very comprehensive approach to the problem. And both from an immediate intervention, but also from a prevention uh, aspect. So the concept of using naloxone, and I know many of you are healthcare professionals, or aspiring healthcare professionals, uh, naloxone is a, uh, a drug which can stop, apparently, the impact of the opioids. Right. It's an anti-opioid drug. Um, so the state actually implemented this, what we would call a standing prescription. So individuals or organizations can go into a pharmacy and purchase naloxone without having a specific prescription from a doctor. So communities that bought into that approach and then were very proactive in doing an educational effort and in training all the different sectors of the community that might be affected by the opioid crisis. So it was training law enforcement, it was training the emergency medical staff, it was training um, teachers, uh, training counselors, and actually training college uh, students because we wanted college students to be able to intervene if in fact they saw a friend or a colleague uh, at a party uh, overdosing and we wanted to we wanted communities that were willing to remove the stigma and we wanted communities that were willing to say we're all part of this and then we also looked at other criteria for these pilot projects. We looked at how effective the judicial system was in diverting um, cases that actually ended up in court uh, because behaviors change when somebody's an addict. You're, you're going to steal, you're going to do all kinds of things, and you will end up, at least some people will end up in the judicial system. So we were interested in how diversion programs were working and if those programs had a, a medical treatment aspect to it, if they were long-term, if those programs looked at the family structure that may have been affected because a loved one was um, using an opioid. And, and what we really wanted was a community response. You know, it takes a village to raise a child. It's, it takes a village, really, to combat this. We've made some progress. We're looking uh, for evaluation results now. The, the projects have been in effect for almost two years. And we want to see which is, what kind of difference it, it makes when you can you know, remove the stigma, be there with an intervention that works, uh, be willing to take a comprehensive approach, be willing to get to the cause, and let's not consider jail to be the alternative uh, because jail's not a treatment program. So that's fantastic, and, and um, when when I when you talk when Captain Burke talks, you guys are talking right now about the downstream part of this, right? So somebody has has whatever has led them to opioids has led them to opioids. They've had some sort of problem, and then it's how do we manage that, depending on, on how how bad that situation gets. But Senator, what about the what are your thoughts on sort of the upstream part of it? So what are your thoughts on the the point when the person has pain in the first place? and is getting treated in the first place. What are the, change, what are the changes you'd like to see there? Well, you know, the legislature did implement some uh, new laws in 2017. Um, many of you may know this, but we do have a prescription monitoring database. So a law passed and was signed by the governor in 2017 that now will require uh, physicians or nurse practitioners, those who are prescribing opioid and opioid-related uh, painkiller to check that database and to determine if the patient has a history of, of using such a drug and what the, the legislation goes into if the, the prescription is longer than seven days, then perhaps physician, you have to rethink this. Unless the physician is being um, released from an acute care facility, then you have 14 days. Um, I'm a little nervous when the legislature gets that detail. We're not medical professionals, but we got a little detail on this legislation. The point I'm trying to make is there's never a law that, that uh, those who are writing prescriptions for these kinds of drugs need to check a state database. Um, and the patient information you know, needs to be there. 
I hope this is the right thing. We don't know. Um, one of the policy things that we had a very lively discussion on in 2018 was actually medical marijuana or cannabis oil. Cannabis oil. Um, we received a lot of information from professionals. You know, they, the THC or cannabis oil, which is a derivative from the marijuana plant, apparently does not have any hallucinogenic traits, but can be used very effectively as a pain management um, drug, I guess, if that's the proper word for it. So we did pass a law, and it, I believe the governor just signed it, which will allow the um, cannabis oil and, or THC to be available in our state under a prescription from a doctor. And uh, we're hoping that maybe that will be viewed as an alternative. Again, the lawmakers were told that it really didn't have addictive traits. So the broader message is, uh, I guess, both doctors and patients need to take a much more proactive role in thinking about a disease or thinking about an ailment, uh, thinking about how to manage it, maybe looking at options that are less drug dependent. Um, certainly you don't want a patient to suffer pain and, and we understand that and that is a noble goal. But we really need to understand all the impacts related to what we do and, uh, and actually, patients need to, to play a, pro, a more proactive role in understanding what it is they're taking, uh, what are they taking it for, are there alternatives, are there other ways they can achieve the same result without taking something that may be a, a, have a heavy addictive element to it. So that's, um, I can go on with other pieces of legislation. I'm not sure they were all helpful pieces, but I, I would like to hear from the other people. Yeah, that's, that's great. And, and I think when we talk about uh, patient responsibility and patient education, that, that is a two-way street and something we can explore a little bit later. I'll, I'll speak from my experience at the American Physical Therapy Association. Really, the, the crux of our Choose BT campaign is not the idea that physical therapy is now the new wonder drug, right? That's not the idea. The idea is we want to, for people to understand that they do have a choice. And over and over again, if your provider is not giving you a choice, it's not talking to you about your options, you have to understand that you have the power to have a conversation. Uh, one of the resources that we provide is this downloadable uh, patient pain profile. Um, it's not meant to be an official medical screening tool. It's just a conversation starter. It allows you to say, do you have a history of substance abuse in your family? Do you want to take opioids or not? Many people we know who sit across from their doctors feel that they, they're on the receiving end of whatever happens next and they don't have any control over it. And so trying to really change the, the sense around that dialogue is really important. Um, Grace, I'm going to talk to you. The, the center talked about um, finding out if somebody has a, a history of substance abuse. Um, you work at Colmac, which is an absolutely fantastic clinic, and, and um, Justin, yes, it is. Thank you. And uh, truly saving lives with what you do. My, my first question is the simplest one. As this, as, yeah, sure. As, as the opioid epidemic has, has kind of unfolded and intensified, I guess is what I should say, have you seen change in what you're talking about, what you're treating, in, in who you're treating uh, when people come in the doors of Colmac? Um, first of all, I do want to say like this is such an opportunity. I really appreciate you know everybody coming and the dialogue and us coming together because that starts change. Um, so thank you um, for having me and having us together. Um, and absolutely, I've seen you know tremendous change. I was thinking about actually you know sort of what the captain started to discuss. Um, we've actually um, been pretty aggressive in how we've addressed uh, the opioid crisis in particular. Um, I um, come from the other side of the bridge, so thank you for letting me cross over from Maryland. Um, and, uh, and, you know, we've seen actually um, a decrease in opioid deaths. Uh, uh, specific, so some of the things that we're doing on the preventative side and treatment side means it's working a little bit. Um, but what we're doing on the treatment side is we're being aggressive. Um, so we're able to look at some of the um, fentanyl and carfentanyl on the treatment, so at Colmac, and we're adjusting um, our protocols um, to make sure that the patients that we see, um, we used to have some withdrawal management protocols that would um, you know, help them so they would not be ill. Um, and now we're able to medicinally and pharmaceutically adjust some things to help them so they are well enough to engage in, in group therapy and, and, and treatment. Uh, can you not hear me? Sorry. Sorry. 
Sorry, I, I thought I was so loud. <laughs> oh, loud person. Thank you for reminding me. Um, and so we adjusted um, our protocols um, to sort of really uh, um, aggressively help them because if patients are not feeling well medically, we know instantly where they're going to go to to get that fixed. And that's actually, that pun was not intended. And so sort of that's one of the things that we're trying to do to, to sort of address it. Um, we have seen um, an increase though in sort of patients. Our population has increased in the opiate as a presenting problem. Um, we've also seen an increase um, in sort of the cannabis um, come in because people really minimize sort of the, the impact um, of cannabis use disorder. Um, so that's been sort of an interesting presentation as well. The other piece that we're really doing to combat the, um, the opiate crisis, which um, both um, the Senator and Captain talked about, and actually in your opening remarks, is um, we're really, really educating the families. Um, because pain is real, and even for our recovering population, we even have patients that have had um, dental surgery while they've been in treatment. Well, of course, they need to have something to address that. I mean, you know, we're nicer than we look, and so we sort of have them. They need to have something done um, to treat that pain, and then it's just a collaborative effort. So signing releases of information for, with physicians and sort of having communication with our doctors to say, okay, what's the course of treatment, whether that's an opiate that's appropriate, um, and then does someone hold the opiate, and is that opiate locked up in a, you know, those kinds of conversations, um, because like you said, it's the, the, the Percocet is not the, you know, the problem, it's, it's sort of the, you know, the disease, if you will, I mean, sort of Colmac believes in a disease model, um, and an illness, and those kinds of things. So, and, and uh, endorsing the disease model, uh, you know, the, there's the, truism, cliche, maxim, maxim, whatever it is, of the first, first step is to admit you have a problem. To some degree, societally, that's where we need to be on the open, evidence, frankly. We need to admit we have a problem. Um, we've talked about stigma, it's been brought up. The stigma of addiction is, is massive. It's a barrier to someone recognizing they have a problem, admitting they have a problem, seeking necessary detention. Um, <laughs> is the stigma evolving at all? Uh, what, where, where are we? Where do we need to go in terms of the stigma of addiction? Um, I mean, it's such a great question. In fact, um, the senator and I were speaking about this, you know, previously, and um, it's it's such a huge issue, um, especially. I mean, actually, I was talking to someone um, at the lovely hour that we had before we um, had the formal panel discussion. Um, in the opioid crisis, uh, you know, sort of the stigma used to be it was inner city Baltimore, and again, I've been in the field. I was very young when I started, 23 years ago, and the stigma was it was inner city Baltimore, and it was uh, you know IV heroin only. And now that it's come out to the suburbs, and it's you know the Caucasian population, and you know sort of the you know, now it's sort of the stigma has changed. You know, it's, it's all of us that you spoke to. Um, but I think still it's, it's, it's embarrassing. You know, um, I went um, out to dinner um, at Tyson's Corner at Earl's um, last night and um, the waitress um, had track marks, fresh track marks on her arm. And she was 22 years old, uh, blonde, um, you, know, you know, adorable. And my heart broke, you know, for her um, because I, I get it. Um, but I know that someone else that's looking at her is thinking, you know, not empathy, not, oh, she, she needs help, not, you know, it's instant judge, it's instant, you know, what's, you know, what's wrong with her. So the stigma is um, still something that we need to combat. And I think the, the gift is for all of us to be here um, to know that that's someone's sister and someone's, you know, daughter and someone um, that hopefully will, will get help. Um, but having these conversations that, um, that it's the illness piece, um, not someone that's a bad person, not someone that's, a, that's failed morally, you know, that kind of an idea. And we really do try to do psychoeducation, have strong family programs. That's one of the goals which I'm excited about with the college and university, you know, outreach is like how to get, you know, younger. Um, kids now that I'm mature, um, you know, like <laughs> at earlier, like how to do the preventative so like, so you can get to that 20 year old so then she doesn't have to go do research for 15 more years out there. It's hard out there and it's more dangerous as we're seeing, it's more dangerous than it has ever been, um, so. So to, so to prevent somebody from ever walking the doors of Colmac, one of the things that needs to change, of course, is our, our approach to pain. Um, steps are being taken along those lines. Of course, if we, if we talk about where we are in the timeline, it was March 2016, 
uh, with the CDC release guidelines on opioid prescription. Um, the basic premise of those is just, you know, dose low, go slow. Uh, and one of the other factors which is, is often overlooked is even in cases when opioids are prescribed, they recommend it comes with something else, okay? And that can be physical therapy, which leads to Greg. Um, you know, you have experience treating uh, professional athletes, long experience with that, not just professional athletes, but, but amongst uh, people you've treated. And they're in a different class in that professional athletes for years get collaborative care. They don't just see one person, one way of treating things at one time. Um, how can that, why is that model so effective, first of all, not just from an opioid sense, but just in a general health and prevention sense? And, and how can we motivate that for, for the masses? Um, I'm going to answer the way I want to answer. Sure. How about that way. Great. <laughs> okay. So the I, I'm in a unique situation based on the other panelists here because I was able to work at a professional hockey level, which unfortunately in 2011, we lost a member of the, the New York Rangers to opioid addiction which really broadened that heightened awareness on what we were doing as in the NHL Trainer Society and how we were treating our athletes. And that's when our really, unfortunately, we had to go through that loss to really figure out what we were doing. And we have a collaborative effort when we talk about treating patients, uh, athletes, patients, whatever you guys want to call them. Um, so we have a collaborative effort, but that caused a lot of problems on the opioid side because we had a lot of avenues for our players to get prescription medication. And there's nobody better at manipulating the system than a pro athlete because they're gonna search out the person that tells them that they're the greatest or the search that tells them that what's wrong with them or can give them the medication that they're looking for and stuff like that. Million dollar athletes, great people, they still have a lot of pain and a lot of, of and, and unfortunately for them, it's tied into, pain is tied into finances. And what I mean by is if they get injured playing, okay, they get paid based on their performance, how they play on the athletic field, on the ice, on the court, that's how they make their money. So it becomes a, a real problem because you're trying to do everything you can to help these people maximize their investment in themselves, but do it in a safe manner. So we changed our whole approach to the way we treat people. Um, we brought in a lot of different things. One of the first things that we've done is guys get hurt all the time and, and we just don't prescribe any opioid drugs and when I say that you guys are going to be all over me but I'm going to explain this one to you. We provide Tordal which is a, a, a and which is an anti-inflammatory drug in rare cases. In, in other cases we use Altram which is another narcotic drug but it's less addictive than the opioid drug. So we changed that model a long time ago. And it's really bad to say this, and, and I want everybody who's a physical therapist that, that's in the room to understand that I'm not a mean person. But in professional sports and in life in general, pain is not a bad thing. And that's where I think that, and let me explain on the professional sports side, okay? If somebody gets hurt and they have pain, and everybody has pain, the more experience they have with pain, the less that pain is gonna affect them in the long term. And I, I totally believe in keeping people comfortable and getting people the right care. But then once they have that pain, we gotta find the cause of the pain, and then we gotta address it, why it's, the pain's coming, and try to fix that problem. But there's so much we can do before that pain comes. And that's where we really do a really great job about screening athletes, find, identifying problems before they turn into pain problems. We changed, our, we hired a chef 
and this is how pampered everybody is at the capitals, you know what I mean? We, five years ago, when this epidemic really started, I hired a chef. And my whole goal was hiring a chef was is I want to get in all the good stuff that I knew that were anti-inflammatories, like beets. Everybody hates beets. I hate beets, <laughs> but they're good for you. So I hired a chef to disguise beets into something that our players would eat, okay? And then we did it on tar cherry juice and tarmac and all sorts of other ways to get our players out of that anti-inflammatory stage that causes the pain. So we, we took a different approach, you know, besides controlling how the guys were getting medication and who was getting it. And let me tell you, it is really bad and, and when you don't carry any sort of pain medication and somebody fractures something and you gotta go, listen, we gotta get you on the plane, we gotta fly you home, and then we could probably find, you know, some ma medication so you could sleep through the night. So it's a tough thing, but since we started the program, back when we lost uh, Derek Bugard, we have, it's, it's amazing how our players don't even ask anymore. And it's not that they're tougher. The, 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 they're, they're absolutely, uh, the toughest kids I've ever met was when I started in the early 95, and these guys were tough, you know what I mean? But nowadays, they're a little, I call them little softies, right? <laughs> but, but don't tell them I said that now. But, but the, the realization is, is that, you know, pain is a good thing because it helps them kind of know their body and perform. And I'm, and I'm gonna steal Cal Ripken's thunder, but I had him come in a couple years back to the Caps and I asked Cal, you know, actually one of our players did and, and they were mad about Cal's answer because they thought that I gave Cal the answer. But he said, uh, they asked him, how'd you make it through all of his games and how did you deal with the pain? He said, he goes, well, there's one time I had a really bad shoulder and I'm up to bat and the first pitch comes down, it was a good pitch and I, I was trying to swing for the fences and I missed the ball and it killed my shoulder. It just hurt big time. And, and he goes, and then from then on, I was more selective on my pitching. Mm -hmm. And then he ended up, he, he said he, and I can't remember the numbers, I can barely remember my phone number, but you know, he hit like 300 and he was hitting like 280, he was in a slump. But it's because he had an injury and he had to learn how to deal with that injury to really be able to focus on it. And, and I'm not saying that athletes are tougher than normal people because there's a lot of people out there that are really tough. We need to provide them with the opportunity to be a little bit tougher, but also to the avenue to be a little bit more successful in their treatment outcomes and how we treat them. And it's more than just treating the problem. When the problem happens, we gotta treat them earlier so the problems don't happen. So, first of all, I didn't Sorry. think you were mean until you talked about force feeding and beats. Yeah, yeah, know. yeah. <laughs> uh, so yeah, so what you're talking about is, is changing the culture around pain. You know, we have spent many years, and, and we see this in the drug ads all the time, everything from a mild headache to whatever, the second you feel pain, you should go get rid of that pain that second, that's the culture we've been living in. Um, you know, beyond that, it's it's uh, coming to an understanding that that when you feel pain, the best answer is not necessarily to stop. You know, physical therapists who deal with this all the time. Sometimes keeping moving is your best uh, long-term course. Uh, so I want to give you guys a chance to ask some questions. I'm not exactly sure on the logistics of how this is going to happen, but supposedly this is going to happen. So um, we've got microphones, and I guess somebody will raise a hand, or I don't have to bring the lights up because I can't see anybody. Right? Can take one from the sure. There and if you have somebody specifically you want to, to throw the question at, go for it. And if you don't know, just ask the question broadly and we'll fight over it. I'm Mike Bolton and I, I've been a for the role of Captain Burke for many, many years. I'm a father, grandfather, and I'm also one of my own police and a senior criminal justice faculty here at Marymount. I want to thank everybody for, for your really sensitive, thoughtful responses, and I'm really thrilled that we reached the point where we're treating 
these individuals were victims, not suspects, but not to see what have you. However, a little bit of a, to me, uh, an elephant in the room that surfaced earlier, Brian, when you were giving your comments, and that is, do we have legislation now, or is it in the works, that for these dealers, there should be mandatory, no questions about it, sentencing the deal? All right, Mike, I'm, I, I gotta make sure I understand your question. The, my understanding is that there is legislation in the pipeline right now that um, will bring enhanced penalties uh, regarding fentanyl. Um, I don't know if that is getting to your question. If not, please ask me again, I'm sorry. I think it was, the gist of it, I think, was, was is there uh, legislation in the works for mandatory uh, penalties for dealers? I think that was the, the gist of it. In your state or federal? Right. I don't know the answer to that. Um, I, I don't know if there's anything in the pipeline regarding mandatory sentencing for, for dealers. Um, you know, historically, as you well know, uh, dealers have, uh, have been dealt with pretty harshly in, in the criminal justice system. Uh, Senator? Yeah, she has a I, I think I can answer this, uh, Mike. Thank you for the question and for your service. Um, the way the statute's written in Virginia, there are definite uh, bumps up in penalties for what they would consider the definition for a possession and intent to distribute. Um, and then it's defined by quantities. We have different quantities. It's under the rubric of an illegal uh, substance. So yes, a dealer would, pro would fall under that category of intent to distribute and would be facing higher penalties. Now, there's a big policy debate about, you know, what really constitutes intent to distribute? You know, we don't want to, from a social justice standpoint, you don't really want to necessarily catch the 17-year-old who has more than an ounce of marijuana and apply a corrective action, if you will, or a penalty, because they fit the definition of intent to distribute, which is currently the way our code reads. Anything more than an ounce of marijuana, you're kicked into that intent to distribute. Um, so that's, that needs to be fixed, and we're trying to fix it. There are a slew of other drugs that may or may not more nicely fit under that one ounce definition, but but there are a lot of policy questions wrapped up in this. And what does that mean? Do you go to jail? Do you have a record that you can never erase? <laughs> so, um, it, it's a complicated, that. yeah, it's a complicated issue. But yes, the short answer to your question is there's a definite distinction in statute for a more punitive penalty if you fall under the definition of intent to distribute. Right. And I don't want to get into this with other people, but what our main concern about is that it doesn't seem like it would be that difficult to just take those categories of kind of element or other opioids and these that fall into that specific category and, and not just have stiffer sentences, but going back to what I proposed, mandatory sentencing, so that we're not talking about somebody who's out here dealing with grass to 17 years old, we're talking about some business, so big time money making, and frankly, and I know the attorneys are present, but I, I like it not being negotiable. If the case is if a, a finding of guilt is, is, is made, then somebody has to be. That's a great question. Before we go to the other one, the next one, obviously, it's, it's different. We're talking about fentanyl. When we're talking about prescription drug, drugs, one of the things not to forget is that one of the biggest sources of that is unused drugs. It's somebody who is prescribed drugs, doesn't use the drugs and gives them away or sells them or, or does whatever and that that's often the source different than what you're talking about the different sorts let's, let's try and get to a, a different question is, i think we have one over here the second question was asked oh great do we have another was there a hand here or there hi i'm karen i'm a physical therapy student but i am also a sister of a D1 athlete who passed away uh, in the middle of the addiction, so kind of a unique perspective on the topic. Um, 
But Mr. Smith, I think I was being the most here in your perspective with your healthcare team in the way that you're able to treat your athletes and how successful you have been because of what it seems a very multidisciplinary sort of approach. So my question sort of speaks to that in the ways I think most of us in the room are going to be future healthcare providers, and we may not get that opportunity yet be starting off to be able to be with such an incredible team. So in what ways maybe have you experienced um, before getting those opportunities that you've been able to create that continuity of care with other professionals that have just as much input into the subjects that we can be able to not just treat, but also especially prevent Um, okay, ready? <laughs> um, one of the things I think is important no matter where you work is in healthcare is communication. It's a, one of the things that I think is lacking across the board. And, you know, I'm lucky enough I have really great physical therapists that, that work in, in, uh, in my company. But one of the things I've always instructed and we, we always preach is don't be afraid to pick up the phone and call the doctor, okay? And it's really nerve-wracking because you know you, the doctor and you don't want to question things and stuff like that. But if you're treating a patient, you're part of that healthcare, that's your duty to be part of it. So if you guys see something or something doesn't seem right, you're looking at the patient history and this person's in a lot of pain and you, you know something's going on, Instead of just discounting that part, let the physician know, okay? And then it kind of helps close that loop and that gap on what's going on. Every one of us has to take an interest. I mean, everybody gets into healthcare for one reason, and that's to make people better, right? Because being hurt sucks, right? So that's our job, make it suck less. Okay, so one of your jobs is to, to really work on that aspect of it. And there's a lot of signs out there. And if, if you're part of that care, you gotta bring in your team. And part of that team is other people that you work with, you know, other doctors that's there. And, you know, somebody talked about it earlier about people doctor shopping for opioids. Well, I'm a big firm believer in, in doctor shopping for your patient if things aren't going well. And, and I know that there's a lot of physicians that I work with over the last couple of years and they'll tell you that if it's not getting better, change something up and then keep working on it. Educate your patients on different stuff that they can do to reduce their pain, to increase their mobility, there's a lot of great stuff out there. There's a really a lot of great science on some of the stuff that, if I would have known what I know now, 20 years ago when I started, I probably wouldn't have messed up so many athletes. I mean, the, the, you know, I didn't have the internet. We had to actually go to a book. Now it's all online. So you gotta look it up and be a part of that healthcare provider and, and, and form a good team and a good resources. And don't be afraid to find out who those great resources that are in your community and have to say, hey, look, I got someone here, what do I do? You're not in the battle alone, we're all gonna to be together because at the end of the day, everybody cares about people. And if they don't, they shouldn't be in healthcare. Great answer to a great question. I've been a, I don't know how much time we have, but we can definitely take this one more of this question over here. Hi, I'm Cindy Osmus, and um, I'm a clinical health professional faculty here. And um, my, um, my question is more related to public health and to uh, Senator Barbara Cola. Um, you mentioned five communities that were credited for the prevention program. So I was wondering what five communities those were in the Commonwealth and if Arlington is one of them. Oh my gosh, I didn't bring the list of the five communities with me. Can I send them? It's to probably you? on the internet. We can um, look it up. Yeah. <laughs> <Right. Right. Right. laughs> That's my recommendation. Yeah. Let's go to the internet later. It was the second part of your question, though, right? What was that? What was the second part? One of the communities was Arlington. I don't bl I believe one's in Northern Virginia. I can't say it is Arlington. I, to tell you the truth, the way the state normally distributes money is based on our planning districts. 
and Northern Virginia is all in one planning district. It's planning district eight. So usually the money would flow into the community service board that is the lead in planning district eight. Frequently it's Fairfax County because it's got the highest, pop, largest population in Northern Virginia. So that's usually the way the money flows, but I will get you the name of uh, the, the different names. We'll check Google. I'm wow. sure they were spread across the state because we're interested in getting perspectives from all different regions, rural, urban, south, west, south, north, all within the Commonwealth. But thank you for the question. I'm gonna keep going until somebody waves their hand that I have to stop. Is there a question right there? Hi, um, I work in pediatric palliative care. Um, I didn't know what it was until I started, so I'll give a quick, it's like two sentences. Um, palliative care works to improve quality of life for uh, patients with chronic and life threatening illnesses. Um, so I work with children from one to two days old up to 22 years old. Um, these patients are in pain beyond belief, and some of their parents don't want doctors to prescribe them opioids. Um, my personal opinion is that this has to do with the stigma and taboo that we mentioned, um, but I'm just sort of curious about our comments, um, any insight you ha have into this, um, you know, especially related to children who can't make their own medical decisions. So it, it's a, to make sure we understand the question, so is, is the question be, because of the fear factor around opioids now are we overly fearful? Is that is that the gist? That's sort of my opinion. I'm just curious, thoughts, comments. Um, you know, it's definitely not the same thing in every case, but yeah, I'll I'll, I'll take this one. Um, I'm thank you. The thank you. So um, we deal with that. Um, so again, I work with the American Physical Therapy Association, and um, as we've done this national campaign. Uh, we have people who specialize in oncology, for example, and who are dealing with patients uh, and, and black care and cancer. And they are terrified that with all the, the, the scary headlines that are related to opioids, that we're basically going to overcorrect, that we're going to make opioids too hard to get for the people that do truly need them. Um, I don't have a great solution to that. My answer is to say that's a genuine concern. On the other hand, there's a mountainous problem that is just absolutely catastrophic for us right now, and that's real too. And so, um, so I think it, it's dialogue, it's like this, and it's truly appreciating that there is not a quick, perfect fix, a one thing for every single scenario, and that needs to constantly be part of our dialogue, wherever we have it, whoever we have it with. Um, so it's a genuine concern. Um, I don't know if I answered your question, but it, it's definitely something we need to keep in mind as, as we go forward. Question over here? Over there, somewhere. There. Uh, hello, uh, my name is Cameron. I'm with UTC. Uh, first of all, I was just want to say I didn't know that Virginia had a prescription drug use. I think that's a good thing. Um, we know it's had one for a few years now. I know that that's actually helped with reducing the prescription and a lot of um, issues with that. But what I think is interesting is that once that was implemented, specifically in Maryland, I'm from Baltimore, so I know a little bit about this, is that they actually had a rising fentanyl, but it's been fentanyl on the street that is non prescription. So it's coming in from overseas, so like China and Mexico, or sorry, Mexico and Bolivia. Um, but I guess maybe Captain Burke, maybe you can address this. Like, what is currently going on on the streets to address more of the non-prescription based benefits? Yeah, that's interesting. Really, the, I can't make a, a, a real distinction in enforcement um, as far as. Um, where the drugs is certainly part of an investigation that will occur as to what the drug is that someone because how we come across it is either uh we happen upon somebody through some other legal means that has it on their person or, but more frequently it's because of an overdose so we respond to that and uh try to further the investigation through all the avenues we have available to us um, and really you know to the person that overdosed it, it doesn't matter where it came you know if it was legal or illegal the, the the fact is that it was it was mixed with something else that they didn't anticipate that's often the case and um, so we our approach is the same um, I, I think that uh, on, on the federal level, there, uh, 
there is increased focus on, um, on drugs that are coming in from, from overseas like fentanyl and car fentanyl. But um, from where the rubber meets the road as far as an investigative process is concerned, not much distinction there. I hope that, that helps. Next question. Mm -hmm. Uh, I'm a PT student. Um, my question is for the Senator of Cabola. With in regards to the pilot studies being done, naloxone, um, are they long term studies? Are they tracking the occurrences? Uh, and are they tracking the individuals that are coming back to get one of naloxone? Or are they just master shipping it out? Because if they are just master shipping it out, then it seems like we're just masking one problem with another. And like Mr. Greg said, just, you know, they took away and they made it very hard to get it and they just stopped asking for it. Uh, so we're just going from opioids to a place that's a That's a great question. Um, I mean, the intent of the studies when we dispersed the dollars was really to try to get to the cause of the problem. So you needed a community response to identify the problem, to bring people, to bring the resources to the table, but at the end of the day, it was the expectation that um, you know, individuals would be in a treatment plan and they, in effect, would be able to overcome or find some other way of addressing whatever issue had driven them to uh, the addiction. So now if it was a pain management issue, there are ways, there are alternative ways you can deal with, with pain. But oftentimes, um, you know, it may start off as pain management, but it evolves into, you know, gee, I really like this feeling, I really like this crutch, and, you know, I really, I'm having a tough day, and, and if you have a addic propensity for addiction, um, you can end up being addicted, and, and but there's there should be a cause there that we're expecting our healthcare professionals and our counselors to try to determine why and to actually intervene. You know, there was a study I think it was on NPR just a couple days, a couple weeks ago perhaps, and um, the researcher determined that if folks have a sense of belonging, a sense of satisfaction in their lives, they are much less apt to um, participate in an addictive drug or to take an addictive drug, which was, which was an interesting result. I don't know the rest of the detail. I can only hope that the pilot projects that we funded will actually um, it, we come up with good, solid evaluation data because the most important thing we, uh, we can actually get out of our studies is evidence-based solutions. Um, as a policymaker, as somebody who is allocating your tax dollars, I really want to find things that work, that there's evidence behind, that I feel we get a good value for our dollar and would solve the problem. The other thing that your question relates to is, you know, so many of the headlines and the attention, and naturally so, have been focused on the downstream part of the problem. And of course it is. That's where people are overdosing. That's where people are going to hospitals. You know, shame on us if we're not looking at those people and trying to save their lives. But to your point, we can't get upstream if we spend all our time looking downstream. And eventually we have to start changing the narrative, looking further upstream and really talking about the people who have that pain and looking there. Next question. Hi, um, I have a question about um, federal funding, basically. Uh, so recently, the budget that just passed for 2018, um, $500 million were given for opioid research and NIH. And I just didn't know if any of you guys have any perspectives or ideas on what this research is more specifically for. I know it's um, within the Institute of drug addiction and neurological stroke um, issues, but it, so that's just research-based, but that's not any type of innovation, so that's another question. Yeah. Yeah. I can't speak to that intimately enough that I can provide details on it, but... Um, I used to work at the Federal Department of Health and Human Services, NIH is part of that uh, department, 
And usually NIH would go out with requests for proposals and, um, and look for some innovative, uh, you know, research proposals. Um, one of the most effective things NIH was known for, besides its basic science research, is they did fund research on how to bring drugs to market, how to, um, um, how shall I say this, create community um, um, buy-in around some of the um, drugs that actually resulted from their scientific research. The bulk of the money for NIH does go for peer research, but they have put money aside for some of these other sort of community-based um, uh, proposals that they funded. So I don't, I don't know what they're going to fund. I don't know if they'll be working with other agencies, but I guess stay tuned. Come on. Uh, yes, sir. Sir. Sorry, I um, just want to ask a question because you guys know more than I do. Um, so. So in the NHL, if you're in the substance abuse program, we use an injectable called Viva Vivitrol. Vivitrol. Mm -hmm. So one, I think that would be interesting for them to know what the end game of that drug is, because I think it's effective, correct? Go ahead. Sorry, I put you on the spot. How about that? Thank you. Yep. <laughs> there we go. Um, so Vivitrol is a medication that we use um, uh, in treatment that's also really effective to um, combat the opiate crisis. It's another way um, that it's medication that's an injectable. It's once a month um, that the patient gets the injection. And what's really nice about it, it's effective because it blocks the receptor site. So all of us have the opioid receptors in our brains and the medication goes in, blocks that receptor. So if the patient goes and uses an opiate, the opioid, you know, it can't go in there because the medication's already there. And so what happens though is that the, that the medication is, is already, um, the naloxone is already there and so they can't get high from it. Um, but it doesn't have the same pharmaceutical quality that Suboxone does. Um, so it's a really, it's not addictive um, and it's, you know, again, it's once a month you know, so once it's on board, it's blocked, they've committed, so to speak. Um, what's kind of interesting from the addictive disease standpoint is sometimes, you know, addicts are reticent to sort of get on board with that recommendation because they really can be pre-contemplative in some of their decision making and they want to commit, but they know that since it's injectable, if they're not 100% in. They're, they're in. They're in. They're in. Um, but, I mean, oftentimes, you know, that's where we really use some of our clinical, like our clinical skills, the family, sometimes the, the heat, as I like to call it, of law enforcement, which we love as, you know, really coming all together um, and really getting them to come in. And it's a really, really effective medication. Yeah. Um, so and works so really on, well. a, on a personal yeah. level, Oh, it's back to you. Yeah. I started this mess. So, so it just gives you guys an option on what's out there because I'll be honest with you, you know, we had a player that was addicted to opioids. We, we traded for this guy and it ended up being in my, uh, my wheelhouse or my problem, as they say. Um, so I didn't even know about that, that the drug was even available. And it was fabulous because it was part of the program. The gentleman had to get injected once a month, which basically made it where I didn't have to think about it because I didn't have to worry about where on a road trip is he in his room or is he out of his room or what is he doing and stuff like that because it has, you can take as many opioids as you want, it has zero effect on your body. So it's an effective alternative. Unfortunately, it's not mainstreamed as far as, except for in treatment centers yet, but eventually there's two things that I think is going to happen, and this is what I think is going to happen. One is I think that that drug is going to become readily available to people that have a serious problem and to stay out of jail and stuff like that. It's going to be the alternative that you have to do it because you get 30 days, and 30 days is a lot of time. So and it, it slowly will get people off the drug. And, 
and we've used an NHL and it's been successful as far as we know, knock on wood, because once they're out of the NHL, it's really hard to mandate that they come back and, mm -hmm. and get a shot when they're not getting paid. But you pay somebody millions of dollars and tell them that you want to inject them with a drug that they can't take opioids, they'll do it in a heartbeat. So that makes it nice. The other thing is, is and we haven't even discussed it, but there's a lot of good research that are coming out in uh, genetic testing and DNA and, right. and, and finding those those, those genomics that, that are predisposed people to addictive traits and stuff like that, which we can really use as we're really honing in on personalized medicine, that's where the future is. Mm -hmm. So you could take your, your child who, who parents are reluctant and they need the medication to feel comfortable and live a normal life and maybe have an avenue to do that. We're not there yet, we just gotta wait and hopefully it'll be in my lifetime. My name is Shelby and I'm a physical therapy student, so I'm much like Marilyn. Um, my life was impacted when my cousin passed away from a heroin overdose. Um, it was fully laced with fentanyl. Um, so my question is, my cousin uh, was a beautiful person inside out, like you guys said, that we are loved on our face, but not faceless. But he was in and out of jail, he was uninsured, he did not make a lot of money doing side jobs with what he did. And my question is, for individuals like that, how are they going to get the treatment? Is there a special allotted amount of money that the state is going to provide for these individuals? And also, does that treatment allow them to hopefully become successful with not only combating their addiction, but also being able to become back in the workforce and not be looked at as person that is just labeled by something they're addicted to? Boy, last question is a big one. Um, <laughs> I mean, I'll, I'll, I'll start actually briefly by saying that this applies not to just somebody with problems, this, this applies to all of healthcare. You know, right now, today, it's still easier for most people to get a prescription for opioids than to get a long dose of physical therapy, for example. That's part of the problem. Um, and, and so things like that are going to have to change, um, not just for people who have an opioid problem or beyond that. Um, as far as more specifically to your question, you want to go? I'll take a crack at it. We do need more dollars, more public dollars available for mental health services. The state is investing money in a same-day access program. So individuals who <clears throat> may be in a crisis situation can call their CSB. And um, under this program, the CSB would connect that person right away with a counselor. Now some triage would, would be going on and then the, the person would also get ongoing care. So this is a pretty big step forward for the state. Now we need more money, but we're at least taking it statewide. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, at the end of the day though, it's we have found that there's really a dearth of mental health providers. We don't have enough community-based programs. Individuals who need help really can't find it. They can't access it. Even individuals who have money um, and do have insurance have a hard time finding psychologists and psychiatrists and treatment plans that will fit their particular needs. What one major program that would help us immensely would be if Virginia participated in Medicaid expansion. We have 400,000 individuals who would be eligible for insurance. They're hardworking individuals. They don't have insurance now. And if the state participated in Medicaid expansion, these individuals would be able to, to access a medical home. And one of our studies told us that 77,000 of those 400,000 people would have access to mental health care when their symptom first demonstrated itself. And that would be phenomenal. Because so often individuals demonstrate the need for mental health services and they simply do not access them for lots of reasons. So if we can really help with that, um, with Medicaid expansion and, and ensure more individuals and with that money flowing into the system, we will in fact be able to create more um, medical outlets, we'll have more clinics, we'll have different um, types of services. And there's a major insurer in our um, region, actually Care First, Blue Cross Blue Shield Care First, I think it's all one now. 
And they had a model program where they were giving incentives to primary care practitioners if mental health services were provided on site so they could eliminate the gap. An, an individual saw a primary care doctor and the doctor or, or nurse practitioner also felt the person needed mental health services. There was a counselor right there on site. So I think that's a big step forward. But thank you for the question. So, we can keep going forever, we can. Um, but thank you, first of all, to, to our panel. A round of applause for them, please. And, and really, thank, thank you, everyone, for being here and participating in this discussion. Uh, it's, it's obviously it's essential and important and, and can't be the last one. Jason. Thank you, Jason. Can we have a round of applause for our moderator? It's not easy sitting up here on these lights, but he does have a great name. So, that's kind of um, I want to thank you all for, for not just being here, but actually being present and being honest and being open and being willing to be vulnerable tonight. Because a number of us here have been touched personally by this crisis. And as I said at the start, we want to create a safe space where you don't have to carry that alone, where you can bring it, where your faculty are here, where the university is here, where our counseling services are here, that we can walk through this together. And so I want to thank you guys who, who were courageous tonight to share part of your story and the way that you asked your questions. But I want you to know this is not the, the end, this is the beginning. And we want to, you're going to see some more things that are going to come up on campus. I want to encourage you to participate, encourage you to, to to just bring your friends along who aren't here, because if you think of the people who are here and they've been impacted, your friends who aren't here probably have been as well. So this is, as we say, this is the start of something and not just the end.